Hey Merfolk fans, I'm Joe. Thanks very much for joining me today. If you'd like to support my channel, please check out the link above to my Patreon page. I'm back with a replay of round 5 from uh, a friendly league that I ran with Benthic Biomancer and Deprive in the main deck. Everything has been running like a well-oiled machine. Uh, we're currently at 4-0, and going for the 5-0 the with this new build. And uh, the opponent looks like they won the die roll for this one. So let's see what we've got. Uh, opponent mulligan to 6 and we get to keep this, so like a good start. Opponent went to 5. Blooming Marsh. So obviously some kind of black-green deck. Okay, uh, we really wanted to draw a land there. Whiffed. Opponent. More black-green stuff. Gets a swamp. And Grim Flare. So, um... I should mention, when you play against Grim Flare, uh, you should put a stop on your opponent's damage step. Because what happens is when this guy deals combat damage to you, he gets to put stuff in his graveyard. And if they put like a Lingering Souls in their graveyard, and you have a Relic of Progenitus out, um, you should not let them go to their main phase. You should you know, activate your Relic to get rid of the Lingering Souls, if that's what you think is best. Uh, because if you don't do it, then... It'll go to their main phase, and then they'll be able to cast that Lingering Souls. Uh, similarly, if you know that the opponent is playing with Delve creatures, which I'm pretty sure th these lists don't, but if, if you ever had, knew somebody who did that, um, you know, you'd want to respond during damage because um, they can't cast Sorcery Speed effects during their damage step. So anyhow, it's mainly for the Lingering Souls um, that you want to look out for. So that, that's why I have this, this stop on my damage step here. On their damage step, I should say. So we really, 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 really want to hit a land here. Oh, <laughs> so painful. Opponent mulligan to five, and now we're going to lose this game because they're going to, like, abrupt decay our Aether Vial. All right, so as I mentioned, opponent deal damage. They get to put things in their graveyard. We see a Thought Seize, and they keep two on the top of the deck. Okay, well, uh, like they're going to let us get something on the battlefield here. And uh, hopefully we get to get one of these two drops in at least. Oh, and there's a land. Thank goodness. So this is a spot where we definitely want to pass with the Prive up. Uh, we, can, we can adapt Ben. We can vial in a Lord. But for now, let's just chip in for one, see what they do. You know, if they responded uh, with some kind of removal, I, I'd probably adapt. Um, but they only have three cards in hand. Odds are they're not going to go after our one drop. You know, we're sitting on these two Master of Waves. So, you know, if they choose to use removal on the little creatures, that's, that's probably going to be good for us. I'm just going to take this hit here. Uh, Grim Flayer is still just a 2-2, two -two, so not very threatening at all. All right, so during the damage step, he puts a land, and I didn't understand this at all. Liliana, the last hope. I mean, that's like a mega bomb against Merfolk. Maybe he has one in his hand already? I don't think they run that many in the main deck. Very, very strange decision on the opponent's part. Like, wouldn't they want to draw that Liliana? It's, I don't know. Kind of weird. <clears throat> Regardless, I am going to try to adapt Ben here now. And, the, and he gets Fatal Pushed. So this is a card that can kill a Master of Waves. So uh, this, is, this is another thing that Ben brings to the table. Um, and, you know, I don't think people quite understand um, the, the math, the sort of magic math that, that works here. Okay, so Merfolk, Merfolk is a tempo deck, right? So it, it just, uh, it does a good job on the tempo axis. It, it bounces creatures, it taps creatures, it slows down their lands with spreading seas, you know, counters their stuff sometimes. Um, like, tempo, we're, we're fine, but we can run out of cards, you know, if we don't draw enough silver gills and they keep removing our stuff. Um, so... For them to remove, to spend one of their primo sort of removal spells on our one drop means that we get to keep our strong cards in our hand on the table, all right? So yes, I spent two mana to sort of try to upgrade Ben and to loot, but the opponent says, no, I'm going to kill this guy. Um, I'm not going to let you loot, right? So what, what is the, um, the real downside for us? We lose a one drop. We lose this two mana. That was really just to pay for it. It didn't lose us a card, right? Again, um, the tempo axis, we're fine. The card advantage axis, you know, uh, 
Abzan tends to be fine. They tend to slam you know, Dark Confidant or Tireless Tracker, and then they get way ahead of us in cards. Uh, that's some, something that we need help with. So when the opponent spends their precious cards to kill our one drop, it's almost always amazing for us. So uh, in a situation like this where the opponent is potentially representing removal and I've got bigger threats in my hand, I'll pretty much always activate Adapt. Um, and yeah, if they, want, if they want to remove him, that's great. If they don't remove him, that's also great. So, um, so we won't get to loot, but I do get to bring in a Lord, and then I get to pause on my upkeep in response to the Aether Vial trigger. I'll bring in the other Lord... Uh, and then tick up, and the following turn I'll be able to start bringing Master of Waves into the battle, in, onto the battlefield. And <clears throat> at this point, you know, I'm not really afraid. The opponent mulligan to begin with, so they're low on cards. Our life total hasn't really been threatened by this Grim Flayer. The opponent, yeah, keeps keeps spending these path to exiles. Another that was another piece of removal that could have dealt with Master of Waves. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw a card with Spreading Seas. Harbinger's pretty cool because he can bounce the Grim Flayer next turn, give us more devotion for when we uh, violin Master of Waves. We are just going to take this hit. Again, our, our life total is really not being threatened with this one creature on the table. Uh, they put two Lingering Souls in the graveyard. Um, yeah. Let's see if they actually cast those. No, they go for Liliana, so I, I'm going to lose this Lord. But yeah, Liliana doesn't line up well against Master of Waves. And the opponent is now on zero cards. So, you know, they've done well for a mulligan to five. Uh, but I'm pretty happy. I'd rather be in the Merfolk player's seat here. So another two drop is fantastic because we'll just go ahead and maximize our devotion. I'm going to bounce this guy with Harbinger. I'm going to play out the Lord. Um, <laughs> and between end step Master of Waves... Um, and then another main phase, Master of Waves. You know, it, it, the game's pretty much over here unless they have some amazing draw. We know that they have a Grim Flayer in hand that we bounced, and then whatever they top decked. So we can pitch Deprive. It was good to hold up all game. If they went for something like Liliana, uh, the Last Hope, uh, we could have countered it. But at this point, that's not that's not really that important. We we saw that. Um, well, let's see here. Oh, he, when they discarded to Liliana, they pitched another Liliana. Um, and yeah, just replay the Grim Flayer. Flashback a Lingering Souls. That seems decent, but um, not nearly decent enough. Because here comes the Cavalry. Let's see, is the opponent dead on board yet? Um, they can block the two biggest guys and then take 14. No, block the three biggest guys, and then take 12. So not quite dead, but certainly dead once I bring in the second master. <laughs> certainly dead once I bring in the third master. So I cast the second one, and was thinking about violating in another one, but then the opponent scooped. So an unfortunate mulligan to 5 for the opponent, but while I'm going for the 5-0, and 0, uh, I can't say that I'm sad to see it happen. Uh, let's go ahead to game 2, and I'll check out the sideboarding decisions. All right, we're back for game two. Let's take a peek at the sideboard. So um, this is something that I've, I've been thinking a lot about um, recently, especially since the printing of Assassin's Trophy. Uh, one of the ways that we can lose to these green-black decks is by getting mana screwed. We only run 20 lands, and Aether Vial is part of our mana base, effectively. Uh, we've always taken out all four Aether Vials against these kinds of decks, and honestly, like... 75% or more of the games that I lose to them are because I get really, really choked on mana. Like, I won't draw enough lands. So in this game, again, a little bit rusty. I took out all four Aether Vials, but um, I think, I'm pretty sure moving forward, my strategy is to leave in a couple of Aether Vials. The reason being, you know, some people look at the addition of Assassin's Trophy, and they're like, well, they're going to blow up my creatures, and I'm going to get lands. So I don't have to be afraid of getting stuck on lands because their removal gives me lands. Um, but what happens is if you only have two lands and they have, you know, these path to exiles, um, 
Assassin's Trophy in their hand that could ramp you, they're just not going to play those cards, and you're going to be stuck on your two lands, and they're just going to steamroll you. So uh, Aether Vial, on the other hand, if they have uh, an Assassin's Trophy, and we get stuck on, say, just like a single land with an Aether Vial, uh, they have to choose whether they should use their removal on our artifact that you know doesn't attack them um, and give us a land, which then helps us. It puts them in it puts them in a, in a pretty rough spot. And if they don't remove it, obviously it lets us put a creature onto the table every turn. So this is such an important part of our strategy, especially in this list where we're trying to do m most things at instant speed. Um, that I think it's actually correct uh, to do. To keep two ether vials in, but for this game, I took out all four ether vials and brought in all four relics, so that's an easy swap. Uh, and then let's see, it looks like I took out three deprives, and yeah, that's it. So I took out seven cards and I brought in the second Vendillion click. Um, let's see, two Tidebinder mages, and the four relics. That's it. So four relics, two Tidebinder mages, and a Vendillion click. All very good cards in the matchup. And yeah, this looks like a uh, a hand that can take me to the five zero. So I'm gonna keep it. Opponent kept as well. So hopefully it w it's a good match. Wins up teeth go. Uh, well, Ben's even better because now we get to apply some early pressure. We do want to draw lands though. We've got Relic to keep their graveyard in check. We've got Spreading Seas to uh, to mess up their mana. It looks like they're trying to go for like Liliana with three black. Um, well, this is tricky because, yeah, you know, it's the card advantage thing I was talking about before. Uh, missing lands again. I chose to attack uh, here. You know, Bob's not a huge threat. If we draw a Harbinger, we can just bounce him if he attacks, so... I think we go Spreading Seas here. Again, we really, really need to draw lands. Uh, well, all right. We're three draws in at this point, past our opening, opening hand, and we haven't hit a land yet. Slightly unlikely, mathematically, but nothing that crazy. All right, so Bob's going to get in here, and let's see what the, the follow-up is. All right, so still, still not that much pressure. If we draw lands, you know, we're, we're good to go. We're just going to crush. So, whiffing on lands again. Now we're four more cards deep. And let's just go with Spreading Seas again. Good old Spreading Seas. <laughs> oh, good old Spreading Seas. All right, so we are now five cards deep in the deck. We're going to leave Grim... Uh, but, sorry, Benthic Biomancer back, just so we don't take extra damage from Dark Confidant. Uh, as soon as we get our lands flowing, um, things will get online real fast. You know, next turn, if we don't draw... Well, let's see how it goes. One has two lands in the graveyard. Thought Seize takes away a sp Spreading Seize. <coughs> oh. All right, this is getting a little bit silly now. Six draws in after the opening hand and no lands. So I think the strategy here is to continue drawing cards. Cycle a Relic and don't hit a land. All right, let's keep that Dark Confidant back. Uh, we've now seen three cards. The opponent drew two lands and now has an Assassin's Trophy to deal with our bomb. Should we ever get to resolve it? I'm going to take two more damage here. Our Relic is keeping this thing from becoming a 4-4. Opponent mills a Dark Confidant. Kind of weird. All right, so now we'll certainly draw land, right? <laughs> uh, okay, eight cards in. That's been eight draws since... Since I kept my opening hand. <laughs> Attacking with Ben. Because I'm going to play, what, Marfo Trickster this turn. So the opponent drew a Tarmogoyf. We're going to tap this Grim Flayer down. Attacks with, with Dark Confidant. Uh, I'm going to block that guy. Okay, so Tireless Tracker is like the single card I am most afraid of in certainly in green decks, maybe in the entire format. So 
this guy basically just drew two cards off of Tireless Tracker by creating those clue tokens. All right. All right, that was the ninth card that I've drawn. And I don't even know what to do anymore. So here's a relic. I'm going to crack that thing. Hey, the tenth draw. The tenth card from the top of my library was a land. You know, after this, I checked the math, and I'm pretty sure that's like 99.5% to not happen. So I'm super toast here just because, you know, the opponent still has an Assassin's Trophy, still has a Tarmogoyf. I'm going to try to double block the Grim Flayer, but if he uses the Assassin's Trophy, then, you know, if I draw land, I can play Master of Waves. But he uses Abrupt Decay. Um, actually, I shouldn't say if I draw land, because if he uses Assassin's Trophy, then obviously I get a land and I can slam Master of Waves. But now he still has the Assassin's Trophy in hand, which means even if I get to land Master of Waves, I'm just toast. So Things looking really, really grim. Uh, <laughs> grim. So let's see. Another land would be sweet, so I can play two things, but deck doesn't want me to do that. I, let's cast Vendillion Click. Why not? It's the best thing I can do with my mana. So two Assassin's Trophies means the game is over. Like, I saw that and I scooped because um, we need to stick a Master of Waves in this spot to stabilize. We do have the, uh, you know, the Devotion with the Spreading Seas chilling out over here. But two Assassin's Trophies is just utterly lights out for us. So that was, ex I have to say, it was just extremely frustrating because... My opening hand had two islands, and then just every card you want to see against against uh, black green mid range. We had a relic, we had spreading seas, we had interaction uh, with their creatures. We had master of waves, we had bombs, had everything we needed, and we just needed to draw two lands. And it took ten turns to draw one land. So anyhow, I'm done complaining. It happens. It's magic. Um, and the opponent got there. So that was game two. We're going to have to force a game three here. Uh, let's go ahead and see how it went. Hey guys, I'm back for game three. Fortunately, I'll be on the play. Get that early aggression thing happening. Uh, so this was a really uh, tricky hand <laughs> to, to decide on. So first of all, you don't really want to mulligan against... Uh, against mid-range strategies if you can at all avoid it. We are on the play. We'll get to get the Aether Vial onto the board. If we were on the draw with this hand, we may be more likely to mulligan it because they have a lot of hand disruption. And if they take away our Aether Vial and we're left with nothing except Mutavault and a bunch of blue spells, we can't, we can't even hope to win that game. But since we're on the play, the Mutavault, uh, sorry, the Aether Vial will definitely get out. The question is, we saw that Abrupt Decay last game I think that with Assassin's Trophy in the mix now, Abrupt Decay is down to like a singleton, so we can't really afford to play around Abrupt Decay. And if they decide to go for Assassin's Trophy on the Aether Vial, it sort of opens up our mana. We'll draw an island at some point. We've got a Tidebinder Mage, which is fantastic in the matchup. Obviously, Master Waves is, is solid. I mean, he's a little weak to the kind of removal that they're packing with the Assassin's Trophy and the Path to Exile, but... Unanswered, as you saw in game one, you know, he's just a total beast. Trickster slows him down. Lord buffs everybody. It's a good Merfolk hand. Well, the opponent, opponent went to six, but I don't think they went below that. So we kept. And I should say, I was on the Discord uh, while I was playing this, and I was asking some guys, like, you know, what do you think about this? And people seem to think I should keep it. I was leaning that way, too. Because as I mentioned, I'm on the play, and we get a shot at it. So is this that turn one? Yeah, it, um... Hand disruption, so if I was on the draw here, I would have gotten totally wrecked. So they went with the Lord, which makes me think that they don't really know what they're doing because Tidebinder Mage is easily better uh, than the Lord in this matchup. Trickster is probably better than the Lord in the matchup, but seriously, Tidebinder Mage is, is the easy choice there. Ugh. All right, so we're going to do this again, right, deck? Right. Grim Flare. Better Grim Flare than uh, Dark Confidant. At least Aether is going to go to two. We dodge the Abrupt Decay. That would have <laughs> been so bad if the opponent had an Abrupt Decay on turn two. Actually, it would have been really bad if he had Assassin's Trophy also. Ugh. 
Why does this always happen like when I get to the last round where I'm I have a chance to go 5 and 0 oh, and then you know I make a sketchy keep and then just get utterly punished? <coughs> I think the line here is pass and then trickster the flayer. Um if anything want, is going to eat uh removal, I'd rather the uh, the trickster eat it and save the tidebinder mage for longer term stuff. So yeah, we're just going to tap this guy down, prevent the attacks, prevent the ability from triggering. Uh, I think we have to keep Aetherile on 2 at this point since we have no lands. <laughs> so I'm getting, I'm getting trolled right now by my deck. Uh, it gave me a Mutavolt. I did trim Mutavolts down to 3 to make uh, more blue mana so that we can cast Deprive more, but yeah. Drew that Mutavolt. Now I decided to attack here. Um, you might, some of you might question this move because we're trying to build up our mana here, um, potentially towards Master of Waves, but what's much more likely to happen is we'll just violin a 2-drop now on the opponent's turn, and then on our next upkeep, violin the other one and start ticking up the Aether Vial, um, to push for the Master of Waves that way. It's, it's much more likely that, you know, it's guaranteed that if they don't remove the Aether Vial, we'll get it to 4 counters eventually. Uh, it's not guaranteed, as we've seen in this game in, in the last game, uh, you know, drawing an island in the next couple turns. Well, really, two lands in the next couple turns. So I'm going to crack with these guys, and if I do get the Mutavolt removed, that's one, one fewer piece of removal that they have for, like, Tidebinder Mage and Master of Waves. All right, so the opponent does go with the push on uh, Mutavolt. They're going to take two from the Merfolk Trickster, take another one from their Marsh Flats, and yeah, now we're set up to bring in the Tidebinder Mage on the uh, beginning of combat step. And yeah, I mean, it's going to tap the guy down. We'll see if they have the removal for it. Well, Liliana, so um, we get to just sack the Trickster, and um, Tidebinder Mage sticks around. So we're going to get another turn, at least, of Grim Flayer being tapped. Actually, no, he didn't even, it didn't tick Lily down. He's going to make me discard. So this de Deprive is utterly dead in my hand, so that doesn't hurt us at all. So as I was mentioning earlier, we're just going to respond to the Aether Vial trigger. Uh, get the Lord on the table, tick Aether Vial up, and Master of Waves will be set for next turn. Things are actually kind of going strangely well. Harbinger, a little bit useless since the Aether Vial is already on three. Yeah, but we're going to go ahead and just get rid of Liliana here. <clears throat> sort of a source of virtual card advantage for them. It gets to make us sack a creature or just make us discard something. And right now I'd rather not discard any of the few cards I have in my hand. If I can avoid it. This Grim Flayer, as I mentioned, is going to be stuck. And the opponent is passing. No, 4 drop, damnation. No, it's Kalidus, so... Mm, is that bad for us? I think we'll have to wait and see. If I draw a blue source, Echoing Truth can be decent. Oh man, these two games have been really, really rough on, uh, on land drops. So we can't really afford to attack here. Uh, we're just going to pass to the opponent, and I don't think they can really get profitable attacks either. Okay, well, they're, they're going for the Decay here, hoping that I don't have the Master of Waves in hand, but I do. So that, that Aether Vial, what a hero. Uh, <laughs> just did literally everything for us this game. Thank you, Aether Vial. The opponent draws their Abrupt Decay, and, uh, you know, I've got a pretty ridiculous board right now. <laughs> Another Aether Vial. I, I literally, I only have, oh, I didn't show you guys my sideboard. Uh, I remembered that I wanted to keep a couple Aether Vials in, so I brought those two back in, and I took a couple of bends out. I'm not sure if that's correct above, like, the fourth Deprive. You know, the, the Deprive really didn't do much uh, when I saw it in this match, so I'll probably keep all the creatures in next time. Anyhow, I drew both Aether Vials, and this one came right on time, actually. So I'm going to try to just attack for a lot of damage, but still can't really um, attack with Kalidus here um, with any of my Merfolk. So the opponent has the path, which you know is, is great for them because it gets rid of the Master of Waves, but it's terrible for them because it gives me a blue source. Um, if, you're, if you're keeping count, we started the game with 53 cards in the library, and we're now 7 cards in. Without drawing a blue source? We've got 17 blue sources in the deck. Seems unlikely. 
Okay, opponent draws and plays a Shambling Vent. I get to start ticking up my second Aether Vial, as unlikely as that seems. And with no cards in hand, it seems like a pretty easy play to just bounce the Kalidus and swing in for 8. Um, if they don't replay the Kalidus, then they're just dead. And if they do replay the Kalidus, then they can't really do anything else. So, all right, I mean, it's kind of a ridiculous game. But I'm somehow winning it. Okay, Kalidus comes back, and, um... You know, we were getting close when he replayed that Kalidus. For example, if I just did, a like, an Alpha Strike next turn with things as they stand, he could eat one of my creatures, go to 10, um, and then take 8. So he'd still be at 2 life. If he ate the Lord, he'd be at 1 life. Uh, he's going to keep his Kalidus. And that, that's a, a decent spot to be in, I guess. He still has a lifelink blocker with Shambling Fence. But this Thoughtseize is going to take him down to 5 life, which with him tapped out literally puts him uh, dead on board. Because if he blocks now, he's going to go from 5 up to 8. And then, as I mentioned, he's going to take 8. So I was pretty happy about this Thoughtseize. Uh, guy took Harbinger away from me. I don't. There's not a good choice because he's dead on board, like I said. So I drew Ben. He comes uh, at the last minute, I guess, to high five the team, and they all welcome him with open arms. I decide to ether uh, ether vial in the silver gill adept just for fun. There's a trickster, and we'll swing for the win. Opponent blocks the lord. As I said, he's going to go up to eight, but then he's going to take nine. Finishing the game at negative one. Ah, so we did it. We went 5-0 and oh, uh, in one of the first leagues that I've played uh, with Benthic Biomancer and the main deck Deprives, a sort of instant speed approach to modern merfolk. Uh, so yeah, 5 oh, this league. The previous league, I went 4-1. and one, And I've just started another league, and I'm, I'm off to a good start at 1-0. and oh. uh, That all adds up to a record of 10-1. and one. Uh, Now, we all go through you know winning streaks and losing streaks, but... As far as things go, this is a pretty phenomenal uh, winning streak. In the 11 matches that I've played so far with Ben in the deck, I've actually only lost six individual games, and I've only lost, as I mentioned, one match. Uh, so it just feels fairly dominant um, in most situations. I, the games that I've lost have been to, like, Flood. I think there's only one game where I got... No, I guess a couple of games where I got Mana screwed. But in general, like... The deck has taken two steps forward uh, with this particular strategy. Um, ben is finally a one-drop that I'm sort of proud to play. I don't feel like embarrassed when I played Curse Catcher. I mean, people just laugh at that card. It's like, <laughs> is Midrange afraid of Curse Catcher? They're absolutely not. Is Midrange afraid of a one-drop 2-2 two -two that can basically draw us a card in the late game by throwing away an unnecessary land and drawing us something good? Yeah, they are afraid of that. You know, it's like a, it's a legitimate card. Um, I've been telling people in the Discord and some of my friends that the, maybe the most remarkable thing about Benthic Biomancer is that it's an excellent, like a truly excellent top deck later in the game. Uh, if you've played Modern Merfolk for a while, you should know that as games go really, really long, they're probably going really long because you haven't drawn enough gas, which means you have too many lands. So late game, you should almost always have like an extra ether vial or an extra land or two in your hand rather than play those cards out because if you just put them on the table, the opponent knows what you've got. If you keep them in your hand, who knows? You might have a counterspell. You might have a trickster, right? So turn eight, you draw Ben off the top of the deck. You pay one mana, put him on the table, adapt him immediately. Now you have a 2-2, two -two, throw one of those lands away, draw Master of Waves, draw, draw anything, draw Spreading Seas, right? I mean... In those situations, your one drop turns into a 2-2 two -two that, that loots away an unnecessary card and hopefully draws you gas. Now, at that point in a game, Bendic Biomancer is literally way better than any of the other all-star one drops uh, in, in modern. He's better than Noble Hierarch. Like, Noble Hierarch is trash if you draw it later in the game. Uh, Champion of the Parish, also pretty garbage, right? Because you need Champion of the Parish early so that he grows when all of your humans come out. You know, if, if a humans player gets empty-handed and they draw a champion of the parish, they're going to go cry, right? Because they probably lost that game. So, not only is he the best one-drop, Benthic Biomancer, uh, that we've ever had for our early game, uh, because it can become a 2-2, two -two, 
It can loot away something we don't need. Uh, it allows us to hold up mana for Trickster, Vendillion Click, Deprive, Echoing Truth. Facil facilitates the entire strategy at the, in the early game. It's just excellent with Aether Vial. Makes it uh, more efficient by actually giving us a good one drop to put in when it's on one counter. It's, it's good in the early game, and it's amazing in the late game. Um, so I can't say enough good things about him. Um, the results speak for themselves. You know, I'm like plus, I'm above 90% in my match win rate percentage. I mean, it's only it's a small small sample, but I'm extremely excited. And I wanted to share some of it with you guys. Um, I'm going to keep playing matches. I'm going to keep tracking um, the performance of Deprive versus Wizards Retort. And yeah, I mean, I'll keep you posted. Um, you guys keep me posted. Let me know your thoughts down below. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please check out my Patreon page. And yeah, thanks very much uh, for you know your support. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.